Thanks, John. Ethel, coming back to you, because you see it both at the community level um, as well as within the government machinery. So listening to what's being said, what, what do you really want to see changed? I mean, because I'm sure it's not going to be just unique for the Solomon Islands, but for other Pacific Island countries as well. What ne really needs to be changed in the, s in the sense of structures, in processes, in, in building women's capacities? I think the, the need for capacity building underpins a lot of what we want to change in the region. So I believe that that would be a priority uh, to assist uh, regional governments to be able to focus much more appropriately on what needs to be done. But I think the link between uh, uh, regional partners as well as uh, stakeholders at the national level is crucial and I say this being very mindful of the fact that uh, civil society organizations such as FemLink and other NGOs in in the region have uh, been at the forefront uh, in driving the campaign on women peace and security and governments now need to come on board but I question how, how do we do that how can we be helped to be able to drive uh, the women, peace and security agenda? Uh, that would be, that would be a, a, a call from, from somebody who's, who's on the ground a, as well. We are also still trying to find out what is best for, our, uh, of, for implementation at the, region, at the national level, but also how we approach uh, women, peace and security uh, in our own context. I, I, again, as I said, capacity building is crucial in that regard, but also uh, I, I think there's a call uh, by national governments uh, on our regional partners to be able to perhaps work with us, but recognizing that there is a particular context that perhaps also says uh, one shoe doesn't fit all, that mm. there are diversities I even in Solomon Islands itself, but also between the different countries and, and those contexts need, need to be uh, respected and recognized. Yeah. Thanks, Ethel. Now, I just wanted to also keep you held on to the mic. Um, I also wanted to ask you, because quite often when we talk about political participation, um, it gets generally thought to be just women in parliament. But I know that you've also been doing a lot of work on focusing on sort of the local level, women in provincial councils. How important is that capacity building that you're talk, talking about to be beyond parliament and to look at maybe some traditional structures where that capacity building is needed? If we look at leadership as a man's domain, or decision making for that matter as a man's domain, the need for capacity building is crucial where women at the local level are expected to play uh, an influential role uh, in decision making. It's not about entry into that domain, but it's also how do we best do that to be able to bring about the kind of change that we want to see at the local level, but also the kind of change that our own leaders must be able to bring about. Uh, to uh, impact on what we want to see at the local level. So that would be my... Thank you, yeah. Ethel. I'm going to come to Cameron now. Cameron, you know, one of the things that you've been very closely involved in um, around the annual Forum Regional Security Committee meeting is the training of, of the officials who attend. And um, particularly in the last few years where we were able to get our 1325 bags into the door, but also around the whole issue of looking to prevention, addressing a human security agenda, how can the, these initiatives, the capacity building initiatives for officials be enhanced to include or respond to some of the needs of, for example, women in the Solomon Islands and other Pacific Islands? As, as you, you probably know, the, the Pacific Islands Forum has adopted a human security approach to security issues in the Pacific region uh, from about 2006. And uh, at this year's Leaders Forum meeting, um, 
the human security framework was officially adopted. It was uh, welcomed by the leaders. And this really sets into place a framework, a uh, very comprehensive, encompassing framework, which uh, looks at human security in a very holistic way and moves the, the security away from a state-centered approach to an individual kind of community-centered approach to security. Now, what that means for, for this issue in particular, women, peace, and security, it, it, the human security approach very much places a lot of importance on human rights. And we know that, that one of the three pillars of the, um, the 1325 agenda is the protection of women's rights in, in conflict, post-conflict, and, and um, peace-building uh, situations. So it really brings that to the forefront, I think. And also I think like with the, the capacity building work that the Forum Secretary, together with the UNDP Pacific Centre, has been doing with the, the Forum Regional Security Committee uh, officials, is that um, it, it, it gives us an opportunity, you know, maybe next year we'll, we will consider, you know, doing a, a training session, a capacity building session on women, peace and security. That's something we've already started discussing. But also I think, I mean, we've been talking about the the importance of capacity building for women. But also I think we also have to, you know, have capacity building for men to open up those kind of spaces for women um, because it, it, it won't work. I mean, basically we need to have capacity building for men and women for all, all of society. And I think that, you know, through the wonderful work that Ethel's done and also women like Helen Hakena in, in, in Bougainville, you know, these leading uh, women peace builders, they've really been able to open the eyes of men. And I'm sure they, re they initially encountered resistance from you know, certain sections of the society, but through the, <coughs> excuse me, the, the good example that they've been able to, to, to put, push forward on, uh, they've really changed the attitudes. And I think that, that's something that, that we can work on at the Secretariat as UNDP Pacific Centre as well. Thanks, um, Cameron. It's about changing attitudes. And um, one of the three areas um, of, of the regional action plan is security sector oversight and accountability. Now that's sometimes seen as really a place for women, um, but what does that really mean? And I'm just wondering, Rita, because we were part many several years ago of the high-level meeting on, on gen, uh, security sector governance, which you know is a co uh, combined effort of the UNDP and Pacific Islands Forum. How do we take that through, and how does this connect to to the other pillars, you know, both the protection of women's rights but participation. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, security sector oversight is a, is a fancy word. A lot of people might think, what does that actually entail? It looks into the different security institutions that we all know, police, the justice sector, the prison sectors, um, but also the military. So all of those sectors are actually pillars of peace, but they could potentially also be pillars of conflict. So it needs to be balanced of how the security sector intervenes in, in times of crises, how they are relating to issues such as gender-based violence that um, is particularly sparking, as Ethel has explained, during times of conflict. Um, and so it's very important that women are allowed to be part of those institutions. A lot of times women are still a little bit shy to become police officers. But I want to share with you one example that I saw in Liberia they uh, had a very terrible war for many years and um, for the first time ever a contingent of peacekeepers came as an external force and they were all women and they made a revolution. It was very interesting because people thought how can women, just women peacekeepers, keep peace in a country that comes out of war? And the striking point was that they actually opened up the space for dialogue for women that were exposed to um, sexual gender based violence like rape or discrimination and torture during the war. And people came out and they actually got inspired to become part of the military. They became um, police women, they, but they also were inspired to become active um, in the judicial sector and to fight for human rights in the institutions so that not only the male perspective is looked at, but also the female perspective. And I want to relate it to what was said before. I think capacity building for the national actors at national level but also at local level is what actually brings the change because men and women need to be together to get gender equality enshrined and um, in the context of women's participation we are looking at gender equality which means men and women together so it's not a competition but it's actually a joint game thank you so much Rita um, Ethel 
the, the exit strategy for Ramsey is obviously a very critical issue for peace and stability on the ground for Solomon Islands. And it's also a very important model as far as peace support operations being one of the first regional assistant missions. How would you like to see the regional action plan guide the exit strategy? Do you want to see more women part of the planning of the exit strategy? Ab absolutely. I think it is crucial that women are increasingly involved in the decision making of that exit strategy. If we don't do that, then we would have missed the point and, and it also uh, denies uh, the opportunity that we are given now to ensure that the regional action plan as well as national action plans that we may develop uh, are integral to the exit strategy but also programs that uh, will be sustained perhaps through bilateral uh, after Ramsey exits. Mm. I'd like to just ask you to hold on to the microphone also because um, our sister Helen Hakena, of course, couldn't make it in time from Bougainville due to, to flight problems. But you and her have been at many different forums talking about um, the, the role of engaging women at the community level, but also about, I guess, for us in our work as FemLink, it's about building the next generation, the, the inter, intergenerational connection of peace building. The Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum mentioned that in, um, in his opening remarks this morning also, that we're building the future of Pacific peace. How can we ensure um, younger women are brought into the process, not just because um, they were victims or they, they experienced coups or conflicts, but truly to, to strengthen their leadership. How, how do we do that as the older women, but also as, as governments and, and regional agencies? Yes, uh, indeed, the role of young women and men uh, is very important uh, in, in peace building. Old women like me will will be gone tomorrow, but they will remain. But they also need our support, and also to feel that they also own the process, and to feel that we are interested in building their capacity to be able to lead. So I think what we need is really exercising that leadership, to be able to bring into prominence the needs of our young people, so, uh, so that they can take up leadership and drive the way forward for the region as well as for uh, national governments and states. Thanks, yes. Ethel. Thank I'll, I'll ask Cameron, because you've also been involved with the Pacific Youth Strategy as well. What are the connections you see between a regional action plan on women, peace and security and the Pacific Youth Strategy? <coughs> yeah, thanks, Sharon. Um, the at the, yeah, as, as Sharon mentioned, at the moment there's a, there's a, a framework uh, which is being, the process is being led by SBC, by Maria, the, the youth advisor at SBC, who's sitting right in the middle there. We're developing a youth uh, development framework for the Pacific. And um, it's, in, it's still in its um, you know, early to middle stages, but w one of the things that, that we've already discussed quite heavily is the importance of giving young people the capacity, you know, and also giving them the opportunity uh, to participate in decision making. Um, the Forum Secretariat and UNDP together with UNESCO have already done like a, a youth peace building conference in Auckland uh, in 2010, which was very popular. We're working with the Commonwealth Youth Program as well. And we kind of see that part of this leadership development and providing young people with opportunities is, is working in issues like peace building. Young people are very passionate about peace. They, they want to have a Pacific where they can realise their potential and, and obviously that's not going to happen if there's conflict. So you know, I'm sure that, that as this youth development framework goes forward, um, you know, that'll be an important part of it. Thanks, Cameron. Rita, UN Women is part of the Pacific Young Women's Leadership Alliance, but I'm also wondering, in addition to responding to the issue of how do we build young women's leadership in the region, how do we also help make the connection with treaties like CEDAW? 
because quite often our Pacific governments might say, I'm reporting on CEDAW now, do I have to report on, on this regional or national action plan? How can we help them on the reporting side? Or, you know, particularly as we, we would like to monitor the implementation of the regional action plan. Yeah, thank you. I think the youth is actually the future because if we look at the statistics of the demographics in the Pacific, we see that the majority are youth. So it's very important that they are part of all decisions, really. Um, and I think in that context, it's very important that uh, youth become active in political engagement um, at the local level, in institutions, but also in political parties, um, and that they seek participation and that they also capitalize on the power of you know, votes, because um, if they unite, then they can bring change. So I think that the youth needs to just be mobilized in that sense and be encouraged um, to take that step of perhaps more formal engagement in these, acti uh, in these areas. In the context of CEDAW, um, that's um, of course another tool that we can use in order to help countries to comply, so to speak, with their own commitments that they have made. Um, I think it would be good if we had inter-sectoral, as we call them, um, CEDAW uh, reporting groups where people from different ministerial portfolios but also from the civil society and the youth should be part of that, come together and look at the progress that they have made in reforms that lead to the protection of women, human rights, and also the elimination of discriminatory laws which perhaps impede that process at this moment. So the CEDAW reporting should not be a burden on a country to write every four or five years um, to somebody in New York but it should be a process that is continuing and it should be an own process um, where the society comes together and says, okay, how can we all work together to change the framework under which our society is actually set up and organized? Thank you. I'm just going to, mindful of time, so I'm going to ask each of you to think about the next three years. We've had a wonderful symbolic handing over to the Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum as well as to the Chair for forum leaders. So I'll start with you, John. Your thoughts on the regional action plan um, over the next three years. How can we really ensure a sustainable plan for the future, not just in obviously you know, making connections with the review of the Pacific plan, the MDGs, the SDGs, and the post-2015 agenda, but really building and nurturing a peaceful Pacific? Uh, thank you. Um, I, I might start by just picking up on Ethel's comments about uh, the older women, as you politely put it, um, and, and Ethel's threat that she'll be gone tomorrow. Um, <laughs> I've got bad news, um, Ethel. We're not prepared to let you go yes, just exactly. yet. And, and I think this is about sustainability. Uh, the best capacity building that will ever take place is, um, is capacity building where you see people behaving in particular kinds of ways, providing the kinds of leadership, providing the role models that you need. And it's the Ethels, it's the, our colleagues on Bougainville, it's women from all around the region who are going to do that. So the sustainability won't come from donors providing money, but of course that's an important part and Australia is very proud to be able to do that. But sustainability in this area is going to come from the people who are doing the work on the ground. Um, and it will be from the, the capacity building of the kind I've just described, but also when women can play a full role in the social and economic lives of their countries. Uh, we've seen statistics about what that means economically. There were papers went to the Forum Economic Minister's meeting. We know all this stuff. Mm. Uh, we have an opportunity. We've had an opportunity for some time, but you know, the regional action plan, the funds provided by Australia, the comprehensive way we're talking about it here in the Fale today, really provide us with a wonderful opportunity over the next few years to be able to make a huge difference in this area. Um, and we look forward to working with people to do just that. Thank you, John. Rita? How can we ensure a sustainable plan for the future? Yeah, I think capacity building is a very important part so that um, everybody has the ability to engage in a suitable manner in, in various uh, levels because um, not only is the national level decisive, uh, but as we see now at the regional level, it can encourage national actions. But of course, uh, the local level engagement is very crucial as well. So capacity building in that context of current political decision makers to see the importance of including the youth, of including those that are marginalized, not only the women in that context, but also other peace agents, um, people that are perhaps 
holding different views because of um, yeah, the conflict that they were involved in. So we need to become more integrative. I think that this regional action plan can help. Um, I think Im important is actually that reforms are now really taken up by the current decision makers, that they heed the advice and um, yeah, really the recommendations that come out of those regional discussions and that they don't shy away from changing. Um, I think, uh, you know, like it's an interesting saying, change is always different, but perhaps different is what we need. So they need to be ready to, to embark on that and perhaps, yeah, to start a transformation. Um, and I think accountability is important. I just want to encourage also the youth and, um, yeah, our NGO partners, because they need to check. They need to ask their leaders, what are you doing so that we can actually see changes? What are you doing so that we can become part of your discussions? And very simple, you know, like things can be done tomorrow by opening the parliament for public hearings and allowing NGOs to present papers on certain situations that affect their lives. Um, and I think in, in many aspects there are other structural reforms that we can bring about, like introducing temporary special measures for women. Um, UN Women has been working a lot on this with partners and we hope that we can see a breakthrough so that actually in three years' time, when the next elections happen, more women get elected. Thanks, Rita. Um, Cameron, the Pacific Islands Forum has been opening up spaces for civil society, particularly the twice a year um, dialogue with civil societies. Are these one of the spaces that you see could be enhanced as a way forward? Thanks, Sharon. Um, yeah, I think it's very important. It's a, it's a, the CSO dialogue has been happening for a number of years now, and um, it's a very important space for the, for the forum. Um, it's an opportunity for civil society to put issues to the Forum Regional Security Committee and receive responses to them. Um, it's a way that, that, that the Forum Regional Security Committee has really started to open up over the last few years. And so what, what the, you know, the, the Secretariat now is the host of the reference group will be hoping to do is that to, um, you know, to, to work with our civil society partners to see this um, issue um, you know, kept on the, the agenda of the Forum Regional Security Committee and also, of course, on the Forum Leaders Agenda. But just, uh, just before we close, uh, there is, I, mean, I, I do have um, a couple of questions for Forum Leaders. I mean, one thing I think we have to do, we have to consider is that now that um, Forum Leaders themselves have uh, noted this framework as a way forward for the implementation, what does this mean for the main regional security declarations in the region? You know, the, the Biki Tower Declaration was adopted in, in the year 2000, the same year as 1325 was passed at the, the Security Council. And, you know, that was, the, that was 12 years ago. Um, it doesn't talk about women, peace and security because it was a very new issue at that time. And so I think, you know, forum leaders, forum members have to really start thinking about what this you know, now that they've adopted, they've accepted women, peace, security as an issue, what that means for the, at the regional level in terms of the, the main security declarations such as Biki Tower, Aitutaki and Nasunini. Thank you, Cameron. So it's really not just the officials process, but also looking at some of the, you know, the, when we talk about the regional architecture for peace and security, how does this also get it absorbed and integrated into those processes? Last but not least, Ethel, and you know, don't feel like it's a daunting task, but speaking on behalf of all Pacific Peace women, <laughs> the next three years, what, what would you like to see? You've already talked about what needs to happen at the national level, but as somebody who's you know, been a champion for gender equality and women's rights in the Pacific. Thank you. The past has not passed. <laughs> that is a reality many of our women who have undergone the conflict but, are, but also who have had a fair share of uh, some form of conflict uh, I think would face in the region. In the absence of political will we have a tough journey ahead and hence ensuring that our leaders are on board, raising awareness on women, peace and security on the regional action plan is crucial in that regard. 
but women have also spoken. And in Solomon Islands, through a very confined space, they have expressed themselves, and they have shared their stories. These stories have been told with many tears, as the present is confronted again with painful memories of the past. Their stories are a depiction of, con of the conflict as women saw it, experienced it, survived it, and have been impacted by it across Solomon Islands. These women now wish to place on board and bring into prominence the need to pay more attention and focus to their needs. And it is not easy to do that. The original action plan, as I see it, provides that enabling environment to ensure that women's needs and concerns in peace building and reconstruction is understood in the context that women are placed in. I think women, peace and security in the next three years should not be confined to women, peace and security only. Peace and bringing about peace should be multi-sectoral. And so we should embrace uh, multi-sectoral approaches to peace building. But as women in the Solomon Islands also expressed, peace does not only mean the absence of war and armed conflict, but also the absence of all forms of violence inflicted on women and girls. And as we speak, the newspapers are full of it. Sexual abuse, rape, physical abuse. And, and so the reality is staring us in the face on a daily basis as well. So how do we bring the experiences of women during the conflict and the experiences of women now, how do we address peace beyond the guns, beyond the armed conflict? That would be perhaps a question that we need to ask ourselves as we look into the future. I think also that we are talking more about leadership. And leadership is what we, we, we lack a lot of in the Solomon Islands as well. There has been a lot of rhetoric, but, uh, but tangible actions, the kind of things that would bring about meaningful change, we need to see that. And in the next three years, I think our focus needs to be on, on leading. And it does not have to be about politicians leading. The opportunity uh, is given to us now through the RAP to be able to, to exercise leadership from where each of us stands. Of, of our stands. So I think um, we need to look beyond the next three years as well to be able to see how we can engage in perhaps longer term programs, not just projects, short term initiatives, but programs that can be sustained in the long run. Women, peace and security is not an easy ride and hence short term measures will not work. So we need to be able to engage in programs that links and connects the region with, the, with regional governments, different stakeholders together, CSOs, governments, young people, uh, faith-based faith -based organizations, development partners. We must be cohesive in our approach to be able to perhaps um, see how best we can strengthen implementation of the regional action plan. Th that would be my, my um, dream for the next three years and beyond. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ethel Sigimanu, um, the Permanent Secretary for the Ministry of Women, Youth, Children and Family Affairs in the Solomon Islands. As always, a wonderful champion for gender equality, women's rights and women, peace and security. 
John Davidson, Minister Councillor, the Australian Agency for International Development, AusAid, Rita Taporn, Regional Program Manager, Gender Equality in Political Governance Program for UN Women, and Cameron Noble, the UNDP Conflict Prevention Advisor of the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat. We certainly, as FemLink Pacific, look forward to continuing to work with you in moving the Regional Action Plan forward. October 31st, 2000 was groundbreaking when the Security Council resolution was unanimously adopted and it certainly represented what we have seen in the development of the Regional Action Plan here in the Pacific, a collaboration between women's rights, women's peace activists, um, other civil society partners, development agencies, and the UN system. And I think what's key and certainly the message throughout the morning has been, this is more than a symbolic launch of the RAP. This is certainly day one of the implementation of the Regional Action Plan on Women, Peace and Security. Thank you so much for your contributions.